And I think we're live. Are we here? We're Good here. morning, everybody. Welcome to IDOU's Creative Confidence Series. We're here with Kalita Stafford this morning. And I'm here with Suzanne gibbs <laughs> It's great to see everybody. Um, we're thrilled that we have so many people joining the world. Uh, welcome to another one of our webinars. What we're talking about today is um, our course on insights, innovation. Uh, we're going to hold a little session on how to observe, interview, and uncover deeper insights. And so that we're going to chat a little bit with Ko. It's a good topic. Yeah, Ko has a little lesson. She's giving me a little peek inside what she wants to do, but I, I hear I'm going to subject this you are, morning. You are. You are. Um, and then we'll open it up to questions. So for any of you who like to participate in the discussion, I believe in the upper right hand corner, um, or search around in your interface, there's a little nine boxes thing. Um, and then you want to go to Q&A. There's a little chat button there and you can chat questions to us. We have our whole team here with us helping to make sure that we can level up the, the top questions and give you so little nine questions box and the Q&A, or you can also get in touch with us on Twitter, so at IDOU, and, and we welcome questions. Yeah, we'd love, to have, we'd love to have you join in, so you can also let us know where you're joining in from. Yeah. I'd like to know who's here, and uh, as you said, we'll start by giving a little bit of an overview, doing a couple Q&A ourselves, give a sample of some of the things you could learn uh, in the course, and then open it up. So mm -hmm. it's very casual, by the way. Um, but we're excited to have you here. And so it is, let's see, it's 9 a.m. We're, we're broadcasting from San Francisco. And uh, we know many of you dial in from other parts of the world. So good afternoon to wherever you might be today. Yeah, middle of the night. Sam. Middle of the night. Thank yep. you very much for joining us. And I'm going to ask one question to our crew. So I want, it's wonderful to see. We have, we have quite a few people coming on. Uh, are people able to get into the question portion? Do you want, oh, there we go. Oh, we have go. some people showing up. All right, somebody from Honolulu. Oh, Welcome. That sounds 6 a.m. Aren't you an early riser? Massachusetts. Thanks, Camilo. Wonderful to see you. Somebody from London. So we're all together. And I am going to just broadcast this one more time. Thank you for those of you who have figured out the question stream. So again, to join the question stream and to be able to uh, let us know where you're from, look for this, this lovely grid of squares in the upper part of your screen. And then you can push the little Q&A chat button. I think it's blue for most of you. All right. Alrighty. We'll wait one more minute. Oh, Costa Rica, welcome. Welcome. And Glad to see you, Donna, Nashville. Allison, James. Wonderful to see all you guys. Buenos so Aires. Welcome, glad to have you here. Yes, definitely. All right. So with that, I'm just gonna, we're going to give you a little introduction to Insights for Innovation, tell you just a very high level about what it is about. And then we're going to dive into something about interviewing. And with that, really the mindset for the interviews that we want to talk about is really about how to get deeper, how to get a little deeper than your average focus group or a survey-based set of interview questions. And Coach's going to give us course it's only two slides so even if you can't see them it's okay we'll we'll keep talking as well so in in the course um, it runs for four weeks there's time to watch a couple of videos do all sorts of um, activities and participatory things to try out these new skills and then um, we're just checking to see if you can see this video this view and you might it's not like be it's able not to. Working. All right, we're going to skip that part. And you come back to us. And some of you might have seen our wonderful Jeff. 
join in. So we, we do have exit from some of our fabulous crew here. We have M Havens, who if any of you have taken any of her courses, you may you may recognize her. She's one of the fabulous um, uh, part of the teaching team who helps run many of our courses. We also have Madeline, who is one of our gurus on Twitter and helps keep all of the conversation flowing there. And then we also have Jeff. And so they're all they're they're surrounding us, but but also part of our team. All right, so Co, if you could just talk us through like yeah. the overview of the five lessons yes. and insights for innovation. Yes. So at IDEO, we've taught we've taught insights for many many years with all of our clients and many organizations. So between the two of us, we've worked for hundreds of clients across many industries and. There were, in this process, there were five types of learnings and skills that we constantly got asked to learn, people wanted to know. So those are the, those are the basis of the course. So the first one is observing. And it's all about listening with your eyes and how do you really see people and what they value to understand their needs so you can design more human-centered experiences and products. Two is um, what we call extremes. So many of us learn from um, design for a core audience, which is, Super important. For inspiration, we there's a lot we can learn from extremes. People who might not be the first person you think of when you're designing something or trying to um, meet needs. Mm -hmm. So we talk about extremes and how valuable they are to get to deeper insights. Uh, the third is interviewing, which may not be surprising. People hear about that a lot. But there's a lot of nuance and craft to how you get to deeper insights with people. So that's one of the things I'm, we'll, we'll dive deep on that yeah. in just a moment. And then uh, we also have immersive empathy. Now, this is not an obvious one, and it's one of my favorites. It's, it's not enough to just observe and talk with people. You want to feel, you want to feel their world. You want to see how things, feel. you need to feel it in your body. So we talk about how you can create experiences for yourself and your team uh, to get closer to the people for whom you're designing. Yeah. And then, of course, the big one is um, how, do you, how do you package all this up? How do you, number five is sharing insights. How do you narrow it down and make sense of it to get to an insight that motivates people, that motivates your team, your organization to do things? Yeah. So those are the five overviews. We've got a little glimpse oh. of a team <laughs> mid-insights process right behind. So this is a team that's just come back from conducting interviews and observations, pinned up some pictures, is putting up post-its of the things that they saw and learn and sort of moving them around to synthesize. Okay, so with that, I thought what we want to dive into today is about interviewing and how do you do this in a way that really gets you at yeah. deep insights yeah. that, that push thinking forward from a creativity and an innovation perspective. And so Ko told me that she had a little something up to see that she wanted to do with me today. So. I do. So you and I are going to, I'm going to, um, we're going to replicate a portion of the course where we talk about interviewing and I'm going to do one of my favorite techniques which is I'm going to do a crappy interview. I'm going to show, I'm going to show what it's like to do a bad interview so then we can reflect on what doesn't work about it and then we're going to do, I'm going to show you how you can do a good interview and we're going to keep it very brief. I'm just going to ask you two or three questions and the bad one will then reflect and I'll do two or three questions which will be the good one and we'll reflect again. Okay. Um, and so for this we need, so you know this is coming, but you don't know what I'm going to ask. So, so we'll see how this works. Okay. But we need, we, need a, we need a project challenge. So the entire, for all good interviews, you have to have a, a theme and a focus. So for this, I want you and I to pretend that um, I'm working for a, a healthcare company who is okay. looking to improve their, their exercise and wellness services and products. Okay. For we business. certainly get a lot of questions about how to, how to help people more naturally improve exactly. their health, their well-being, all those things. Exactly. And in this so. case, it's for busy professionals, which I think you can relate to. Okay. So um, I'm coming to interview you, and I really want to understand what you care about, your values and your motivations for wellness and exercise. Okay. okay. So, so again, people, I'm doing it crappy, so <laughs> <laughs> don't... We'll just keep it one brief, okay. one, one moment. So, um, what are your thoughts on exercise? Um, I try to exercise. Uh, I know it's important, and I, I do it as often as I can. Okay. How about uh, running? Do you like to run? I hate running. Oh, it's, really? It's, yeah, it's something I never oh. stick with. See, I love running. I think, I think everyone should do it more often. Um, have you thought, why, why not? Have you thought about trying it more? Um, I've just never been a runner. Really? Yeah. Okay. So 
not my thing. Uh, let's cut. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so let's reflect, and I'll I'll explain like what I think didn't work about those questions. But I want to hear from you first. What do you feel like I know you? Do you feel like I understand what you care about? Yeah, I mean, there's, it's funny because we know each other really well. Um, I don't think I've ever been interviewed you by you before. <laughs> and that was just so strange because you went straight to the thing I like the least okay, about exercise, which is running. And so I just was like, don't even want to talk about it. And also just asking about something as broad as exercise. I, I didn't I, even I couldn't dig into my brain at this hour of the morning to think of something helpful to share with you. Okay, so I love that you already pointed out one thing. So the first question, thoughts on exercise, it was way too broad. Yeah. Like you just, it's, so while open-ended questions are always good, they can be too broad. Like you just, you didn't have anything to grab onto there. And then I went way too narrow. I went to running, and as you said, you don't have any relationship to it, so it didn't do anything for you. Um, so that was a problem. And then there was one other thing that I did that was really, really unhelpful. Can you guess what it was? <laughs> when you're telling me how you're such a great runner, <laughs> I was like, so I'm not, I'm not at all. But that was a problem. Like, so I inserted my values into the conversation. So it didn't give, so I know nothing about what you actually value. So my job is to listen deeply and invite questions that helps you steer me to what matters for you. So can we try this better? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. So we're gonna try this again, and this time um, I'm gonna teach. I'm gonna I'm gonna do it well. So in this case, um, same thing, same project challenge, but I want to get to know what you really value around exercise. So hi, Suze. Can you tell me? Think about a time when you have a really great memory around exercising, or there was a delightful moment about doing exercise. Um. I think just at the weekend, I had a great experience where, um, you know, I'm always trying to get a little better, and somebody had suggested an app that um, I thought sounded interesting. I mean, I know there's an app for everything, but I tried it. I did it with my whole family, so my husband was doing it, my 10-year-old daughter was doing it too, and it was kind of fun, and it was like a little seven-minute workout, and so we just kind of felt good. We got a little extra bit in there and it was fun so and we've done it again you have them you have to show me can you do you have do you have I'm your phone? On my phone you have your Always. phone so can you show me and show me uh show me specifically like one way you used it or one thing you did with it yeah so it's um wahoo special product placement for you guys and um, it's this little seven thing okay i haven't gone very far with it yet but it's so cool it just has like these little things in here, okay, and it gives me little exercises, and you just start, and it talks to you, and it kind of keeps you moving in case it's fast. Wow, it's just fun! Wow, yeah. I love it. So, one more question, and then we're gonna break. This is so helpful. Let's say I want you to imagine that you were at a cocktail party with mm -hmm. other people like you, busy professionals, and you wanted to convince someone that they should also give this a try. What would you say to convince them? Um, I think what I like about it for somebody who's always trying to fit fitness in is that it's just so accessible and doable and you feel good because you feel like you've, you can check that you did it and you feel like you're going to do it again. And so it fits well in your life. It fits fitness in your life. I love it. Thank you. Yeah. And see, <laughs> so let's reflect on that. Yeah. Let's reflect on that. So, um, do you feel like I have a better, do you feel like I better understand you and what you value? Yeah, I mean, I think that um, asking me for something recent yeah. was so helpful for me to be able to connect it beyond like exercise, but saying like, tell me this week. And so that's one of my favorite tips is, that, is, is to ask questions that um, invite you to show me because we know very well that what people say and what they do can often be misaligned. So my favorite, one of my favorite techniques is to do what's called show me questions, and that's why I ask you to give me your app. Show me how you used it, what you did, because then I, I see how it actually, not just, because general questions can be difficult to work with. Mm -hmm. So that was one. The, um, 
again, I, I started with an open-ended question, but this time I asked for you to tap into an emotion. Mm -hmm. I asked for a moment that felt delightful. So we, we naturally know how to add, answer questions that uh, trigger something emotionally. And then you revealed to me, you took me to what mattered to you. You showed me short workouts that work out in your life with your family, and then that's what you needed. And the last question, I, um, I asked you to give me a scenario. I reimagine a scenario. So I find that asking people, uh, why do you like something, is, is actually a really difficult question. We don't always know how it will be like, um, it's easy. Yeah. But if I ask someone, like convince someone why they should do it, you unlock all of these values and you reveal to me in that moment, you're like, well, you can fit it in your life and you get that, um, that checklist. It feels like I've accomplished something. So now as a designer, I know what you're looking for. So as I go to think, so I have a deeper insight on someone like you needs, needs to feel like you can accomplish something and it needs to feel, it has to have a quick, easy start and just fit in your life. Yeah. yeah. So great. So those are examples so, of yeah. just reviewing. So the, the yep. show me yep. technique is a great one. Mm -hmm. Some of the other things are about, um, asking for a concrete story. Yep. Asking for an emotion. Totally. Um, and, and definitely making sure it's not too general, not too specific. Yeah. So those are all, all great tips. Um, so thank but, you for playing. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. And thanks I hope I hope that was I hope that was helpful and insightful. And that's that's where we focus. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, maybe one. Mm -hmm. I have one or two more questions, and then as you answer that, I'm I'm looking up at our at our screen where questions are flowing in from everyone all around the world, but. Um, one of the things I wanted to ask you is, is how have you um, how, how have you helped other people practice getting better at asking questions? Or like, what do you what do you do with people when you've I know yeah. you've hired lots and lots of people yeah. at IDEO, and we have lots of people who are not yeah. deep researchers who come on and yeah. build their confidence yeah. to conduct better, stronger interviews and observations. Yeah, but I, I love this question. So um, this is part of the core of how we designed the course, um, which by the way, I know one of the questions was, when does it start? It starts next week. <laughs> June 8th. So one of the ways, um, there is no better way to teach this than to do it. You have to practice it. So um, that was the point of how we designed the course was, um, I can't just tell you what a good question is. Now, we did reflect on that, but now if you were a true learner, I would, I would have you, you have to go try these questions yourself. Mm -hmm. And you have to try them several different ways. So that's one of my favorite ways to help people learn these techniques is you just have to do it. It's like, it's back to exercise. I can't, I can't tell you why doing sit-ups is a good thing or how that will help your body yeah. and then and you get the benefits. You actually have to do it. So, um, so every opportunity to practice and um, iterate and yeah. mess up. Uh, so doing it even in safe spaces with you know, interviewing friends and family, yeah. as well as people, strangers and people outside your comfort zone. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And on that point, we're going to open it up to questions from people around the world. We're just going to remind you one more time about how yeah. to ask. Um, we're, we're setting up for our Insights for, um, Insights for Innovation course, which starts next week. June 8th runs through July 7th. If you want to ask us any questions about technique, approaches, yes. any, this is now ask me anything. There's a little nine questions box in your interface, upper right hand corner for the majority, a little Q and A chat button and feel free to send them in. And with that, I'm gonna go to the boards and start seeing um, what we have here. There's a brief can, one from Camila. I, I can, okay, I'll read this. Yeah, do you I'll, read I'll, read out, I'll read it out. Um, so, and we're looking up this way because we have another set of screens. So we're here with you, but my eyes are gonna be in a funny spot. Uh, Camilla, sometimes while doing research, users communicate something just to impress. Yes. Which strategies strategies do you suggest to make them feel comfortable while interviewing so you can get clear and honest information from the user experience? Yeah. I love this question. So, um, and I know Suze is an expert in this area as well, so I'd love to hear your answers. Um, two things that come to mind when I think about how do I get beyond the impress strategy? So one thing that may not be as obvious is my presence in the conversation. So mm -hmm. if I come in, if I come in and I have kind of a presence of looking important and mm -hmm. feeling like I'm expecting yeah. this to be a really valuable conversation so I can do my job, 
you, I'm going to put you in the mode of trying to impress me. Yeah. So one thing I do is I pay attention to my body language and my presence. So whenever I go to interview someone, I will, I, I think of myself as a chameleon. I'm going to match my surroundings and their, and, and your presence and your body language. And, um, so, so like if I'm with kids, I'm going to get down on the floor with them. If, if, I'm with, I'm with, if I'm with somebody who might be a little bit shy, I'm going to make sure that I'm not putting too much of a spotlight on the situation. So that's one, is I'm paying a lot of attention to what I'm doing to, um, to put you in the mind of being so comfortable because I'm so curious yeah. and I'm so excited to meet you. Um, so that's one. The second thing I do is uh, it's so important to be in context. I yeah. have to be... I have to be in a place that is comfortable and familiar to you. So I believe in going to people's homes or their workplace. Um, and so because the thing is too, then you're not making up stories. You're surrounded by all of the things that make you you. Yeah. So um, I, can, I can get to authentic parts of you because I can say, show me. What's something in this house that really represents you? Yeah. So I, I think things. Things. building on that, yeah. I feel like it, the first is about rapport, yeah. making sure that you make that person comfortable, get them comfortable. Um, in the course, we talk a lot about starting broad and finishing deep. And in that, it feels like, you know, right away, you're not going to walk into somebody's house and say, tell me your deepest, darkest <laughs> secret about everything that's wrong with your health. But, um, but after you've been there for a while, if yeah. you've built rapport properly, and you see something in their house. One of the classic stories that we always talk about at IDEO is something that I was doing with a client. We were um, looking at options for the future of personal care, beauty care, for um, Procter & Gamble, and we were talking to men. Yeah. And so we had this guy who was a forklift driver in Atlanta. He was a lovely guy, and he was just such a dude. He was just such a man's man. And by the end of the conversation, said, hey, Carl, what's that foot bath over there that I see in the corner? It was just sitting in this little box. And Carl just opened up and said, oh, that's my little foot spa. I like pedicures. I like to wear open-toed sandals in the summertime. And it was this sweet moment where we realized that on the surface, he only went into a process with his right, typical manliness, yes. but yet the aesthetics of certain parts of his body were really, really important to him, and he put a lot of personal care into those. So I think we couldn't have done that five seconds after walking in the room. He would have told us that foot bath was his girlfriend's. You know, yes, so definitely. Got to work definitely. toward it. Okay, time for another question. What do you see up there? I'm going to grab um, Dara's. Yeah. How do you keep an open mind regarding the outcome of the interview? Yeah. Um, this is an important one, and uh, one of the things we – we teach across all of our IDOU courses is the importance of a mindset. So it's not enough to just only have good skills and techniques, but there is a mindset to every step in the process. And our mindset for interviewing is, is open, mm -hmm. is openness. And so this is this idea of being deeply curious. And um, you can feel if you're talking to someone and they, uh, they are truly open and listening and you can feel when they're not fully present or when they might have some um, some assumptions, being, and so so the way that I, you know, keep an open mind is is I make sure that I truly am being open. <laughs> I truly am being curious, and so I, I treat it as for that hour or ninety minutes that I'm with someone, they are the most important and interesting mm -hmm. and special person I have ever met. Yeah, and um and so there will be plenty of time afterwards to debrief with the team. To reflect and maybe be curious, or maybe maybe question if well was that person telling the truth or yeah or um, but in the moment uh, it's just it's so important and to it's it's almost like a, a magic circle of playing a game. You have to mm -hmm. suspend the rules of how how you act in that moment to really allow yourself to be truly open. Yeah, and it's not hard. It's actually not hard. But you have to commit. Yeah, I think when an activity that we often do with a team, especially when we're working with either clients or other designers who might not be as confident holding their own assumptions mm -hmm. at bay, is to go ahead and list those assumptions. So if it's something about healthcare, what are we look at ourselves, we empathize with that question ourselves so that we have greater awareness when we go in. And looking at extremes as yeah, yeah. we find people who push our boundaries and challenge our assumptions. And so we make it, we almost over accentuate it in terms of talking about it ourselves 
and finding people who push us so that we can really be aware of those boundaries. Whereas if you're interviewing somebody who's really close to your assumptions, but yeah. maybe subtly yeah. different, that's when it's really hard to, to call it out. Yeah. I'll take a we have, one. We have so many, yeah, we have so many good ones. And again, thank you everyone for joining yeah. us. And, and I know we can't get to all your questions, but we are, we are trying to help to um, do some upvotes so we can kind of see where other people are curious. Yeah. Oh, I like the one about um, Go Skyping, it. doing things, interviewing online, interviewing remotely, conducting yeah. insight sessions. We've done some work yeah. on this together. Yeah. Like what are some of your tips for getting quality and depth? Yeah, so one of my favorite tips is, um, is to think about the pre and post yeah. Skype interview. So of course, of course you can't always go to someone's home. So you're gonna do it remotely. So I will often think about how I'm gonna introduce myself and the team before we even get to the interview. And I often encourage, so let's say I'm gonna interview you remotely, let's say you live in London, and um, I'm going to interview you next week. The week before, I would I would contact you and I would ask you to send me ten photos of your life. Yep. So I would get a little bit of context, and I would get I would get you to warm up a little bit to what we expect. So I might give you ten themes, like um, let's say it's it's all about commuting is going to be the topic of our conversation. I would ask for things like. Um, this week, take a photo of um, your, your favorite part of your commute. Take a photo of um, your most stressful moment. Um, take a photo of something you value in your house. So I and my team then have a little bit of context about you, and you are going to come to that interview a little bit more open and curious about us as well. So that's one thing. And then in the interview, the same, the same techniques apply in terms of establishing rapport, starting broad, going a little bit more deep. And then I think about the follow-up as well. So you and I will make a connection in the Skype interview. Mm -hmm. um, and it's still important then that I follow up with that. So um, I might follow up with like one other task or conversation point. Like, okay, I will have learned something about you that I might want a little more info. So I just extend it a bit. Because um, the last thing you want is for it to feel really contained and brief. You want to make sure you're getting authentic conversation out of that experience as well. Yeah, I just thinking of something that yeah. we worked on together with a telecommunications project. Um, this is just something that it's, it's a kind of experience that's not one big experience. We were working on a piece of technology in homes, improving communication in homes and with families. And it was something that was little teeny tiny bites. It was just like yes. constant throughout yes. the day, remember? Yep, yep. And, I do. Um, I do. And so we wanted to study it, and we needed people to be over time, and we needed people distributed across mm -hmm. geography. The, the setup we had made it all really sing. So we did little Skype interviews from webcam interviews, but we had a whole system like a wall inside of the house where the family was kind of tracking all of their um, usages of this piece of technology. Yeah. Um, they were tracking their emotions. We had little prompts that we would send them. We'd send them like questions to punctuate the week. And then we'd get on the phone and do the, the web interview with one or two family members. But they could look at the boards and give us feedback from everybody in the family. And so it's that creative means to journal and really track the experience before and after really, really can help it sing. What else do we see over here? What's getting a lot of I think, should I, should I go to Nikki? Yeah. yeah. So. Um, Nikki, this is a great question. It's often the case that people are not aware of their desire or needs that actually exist. What kind of questions are helpful to extract latent needs and desires? Yeah, I love this one. Mm -hmm. So this is, um, this is, we often talk about, I'm gonna draw a little something here. Let's see if this works. So we often talk about, and Jane is just masterful at this. Jane um, Fulton Jane Surrey, Surrey, who co-teaches this Exactly, course. and so, this is a crappy drawing of a person, but you can see. So, you know, we have what people say. And so I can ask questions and I hear what they say. And this is backwards, sorry. I can see what they do, but we, we really want to understand is what they, they think. So this is their brain and their heart, what they feel. Um, so one of the things, so interviewing alone is not enough to understand latent needs. So we, we believe strongly in like I mentioned, in pairing it with other techniques, I think about, is it this 360 view that I want to get of someone? So interviewing is one technique, and there are better and worse questions that help you understand needs. But the other one that is just so important is observing. Mm -hmm. So looking for you know, what people do, and they may not even be aware of doing it. 
Um, and we can think of an example. And then, of course, um, parts of your experience like immersive empathy. So um, uh, I'll, I'll try to think of I mean, a better example. I can too, but think yeah, of one sure. in, that's an immersive empathy example that was such a powerful experience for me personally. We were doing a, a project on rheumatoid arthritis, which is a a form of arthritis that strikes a lot of women kind of in their like late 20s to mm -hmm. early 40s. And we were trying to figure out how to help a um, healthcare company communicate the products and services that they had. And so we were interviewing lots of people about rheumatoid arthritis. And it was, a, it was the classic scenario where what people would talk about were all the medical issues, all the like physical ailments. Um, the trouble yeah. of yeah. getting information and getting services, these kinds of things. Um, and nobody really talked about how it made them feel. Like it just wasn't, to, I think, the points of some of the other questions earlier, like wasn't this place people were ready to go? And so our client worked with us to literally create an, an immersive empathy experience. We taped our joints to feel the restriction that it feels like you have when you have rheumatoid arthritis. And we spent like two hours just walking from right here, this office, down to a coffee shop that is literally like less than a mile away and paying for our coffee and our hands were taped and our joints were taped and we couldn't move our knees. It was so painful and it was, and the whole team was doing it together and people were looking at us funny and like, as you're trying to pay, people are like, speed it up people, you know, this is, we're, we're trying to get through this and you had to move so slowly. And what we felt afterwards, what we could empathize with from this experience was the, the depression that yeah. comes about from yeah. having this chronic disease that people weren't ready to talk about as part of it. It wasn't on the surface. And so that, that immersive empathy experience really helps the team get something that was beneath the surface and articulate it. Then we could take that after the broad part, the deep part of the interview and ask people about it and we started to realize so many of these women were dealing with depression issues, and that was really as critical as some of the physical ailments that they were dealing with, and we needed to communicate about that too. So yeah. that's, uh, immersive empathy I think is, is tricky to get it, but a small investment in yeah. time can really go a long way to, yeah. to helping to push the thinking. Yeah. yeah, thank you. I just love too that you even asked that question because um, that we want people to be in is to go in with the assumption that you don't know what people need and sometimes people themselves don't know and so it is your job and your opportunity to be really curious about the unspoken things because those are the best moments with best opportunities for design so just being attuned to that I love that you brought that question up and you're aware of it you're you're ahead of many people in this space. Can I say I just love that the fact that somebody's in from Buenos Aires is getting four upvotes. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> I love Buenos Aires. It's an awesome town. Um, let's see. What else do we see up here? Um, I want to do the one from um, Fuji in London real quick. Oh, and then we can go to that one too. But um, yeah. how do you feel about online surveys? Yes. Um, and when is the goal to get a, as many respondents as possible? We love this question. So, of course, there is a time and place that surveys are really critical to the design process. And the way I think about it is, um, I call it the hybrid sandwich or the mm -hmm. hybrid hamburger. Uh, if you think about, if, if the survey is going to be the meat, because at some point you do want to get to scale. You yeah. need to, for your business strategy, you need to you need to show some scale of relevance of numbers. But I like to think about qualitative interviews with a few people as kind of the buns to sandwich. So anytime I'm going to do a survey or launch a survey, I'm going to start with qualitative interviews to really to develop better um, insights and assumptions and hypotheses to inform the design of the survey and how I'm going to ask those questions. Like one of my favorite ones was um, we worked and then, and then after the survey, I'll do follow up with, let, let's say we do a survey and you come out with clusters and segments. I'll then do follow-up interviews with those different people in those clusters and segments to validate, cross-validate the, the survey. So my goodness, yes, there is a place. I would never do only surveys. Yeah. Um, I would I would probably never do only qualitative too. Like you they they are best together. Um, I want to give one example of I see a lot of surveys go wrong in um in how they just present the language to people. So like we worked with one organization that was a, a food and beverage company and in their internal culture, they had this term of meal replacement. 
so when do you do meal replacements? And it was, what they meant was snacking, snacking. And so, so it's, it's really important to, to start with qualitative interviews to get the language and the way that people talk about and think about. This one's so obvious, it's comical. But it is true. Um, I think a lot of surveys, uh, because they're written internally, you can, you can front load it with too much of your own internal language that, you're, that the public doesn't necessarily respond to. So I think part of qualitative helps humanize surveys to, pre to, to present better data. So. Yeah, or we talk a lot about the why and the what. Yeah, so yeah. data surveys is great mm -hmm. for what, but not so great for understanding why and adding that color. So how do you mix the data with rich human stories? Yeah, yeah. Um, there's one question that's getting a lot of upvotes here that I love uh, about how do you decide how many people you're going to yeah. interview. That's always a challenge. Yeah. And so what are some tips and tricks on that? Yeah. So um, there's never enough time, right? So um, we talk, so one of my favorite techniques for this is um, what we talk about in extremes. So um, let's say I only have a week, which, which for some projects is the reality. So what, what I would do is we start by thinking about the, what is the landscape of people who we think are in our target, our target audience? And then we're gonna look at the extremes. So what I try to do is I try to map out extreme people within the landscape, and if I can get to eight to 10 of them, I actually start to have, all together, a high-level picture of the people in my target audience. And more importantly, I have some extreme understandings of the needs. Um, and so we also commonly see that as few as eight to 10, after about 10 people, you start to see diminishing returns. So there's good studies that show the first six to eight people, you start to hear about 80% of the needs. So you can then either spend your time extensively with another 20, 30 people to get that last 20% or 10%, or you, can, you, you have enough of the kind of core needs to really start to take action. And so, um, and I think the important thing is too is, what are you using interview for? Is it yeah. to validate your market size, in which case I would, I would consider much higher numbers. Is it to find insights that can be generative to design, yeah. in which case a single interview, a single interview can spark that process. And then of course you would continue to design additional layers of research to support that, but um, that's my first thought. Yeah, I mean, I, I think same thing there. In, to oversimplify the world, two types of studies. There's something that's more about validation, metrics, measurement, segmentation. There you need quantity, or you're proving or evaluating yeah. something. You do need volume there, mm -hmm. qualitative and quantitative. Mm -hmm. But if it's about discovery, I think this course is very much about yeah. insights for innovation, to inspire, to gain empathy, to, and to come up with those radical new ideas. That's much more, it's a different kind of a recruit. And so this is one little tool. We weren't even able to work this into the course because there was just so much in there already, so I'll share it here. <clears throat> I know it's backwards, but this is a little diagram that we often draw with the team at the beginning, and we think we want to explore. So there's the core, and that's, you have to tighten that core question. What is the challenge? And that's often, what is the brief? And that's a place that it gets messy. And so keeping asking, what's the heart of this? How do we tighten this so that we get good coverage? How do you then look for extreme users around that core? And then how do you also look at analogous? And this is yeah. really important when you want innovation and radical innovation. So let's take healthcare. Right core, you might be looking at the, the thing that Co was trying to interview me for. Busy professionals. All right, get some men, get some women, get the ages that are in the core audience, get healthy people, not so healthy people, right? Those are your tensions. But then in extremes, like I would look at, I would look at somebody who, like a, a quantified self addict, like yeah. somebody who has, who is just always constantly tracking, because we know, like we know that data and just personal understanding is driving some of the designs happening in exercise. So I would look at someone who's on the edge yeah. of that behavior, and maybe somebody who's um, ill and has yep. something that's restricting the things that they can do, and they're really challenged on that. So you, that's extremes. And then analogous, like what would we look at for analogous and something about health and wellness and behavior change? Um, I might look at, well, I have to think about that one for a second. Could be like somebody who's learning something new, um, going through. Anyone in a transition, like where there's a transition state. Just um, had a baby and your whole life is shifting. Yeah. And you're trying yeah. to learn new things there. Yeah. Could be something. So but I think it comes back to how would we define that core question 
if the crux of that is about behavior change and bringing more health and wellness in your life mm -hmm. and changing behavior, you could take the thread of behavior change and right. look at quitting smoking or right. something like that. It's tightening that core to know. And then again, as I said, there's never enough time, but something's better than nothing. So. And you can learn. We've got about five more yes. minutes. So we should, um, I want to tune into a couple of questions that at a higher level, and, and I welcome the team if there's anything else to draw attention to. One question from Ellen, are the, are the videos live or recorded, edited? Yeah. Yes. This video? So inside of the course. Um, this video is live right now. Yeah. Yes. Inside Sorry, of the Ellen, course, the, the videos are, um, are edited, and we've done that yeah. for multiple reasons. We want to bring you the best of lessons from multiple people all across IDEO. But they're all short and sweet. We think of them as YouTube length. Yeah. So they're around three to five minutes. Inside of each lesson, there are a couple of videos. So you watch those videos. So we think about the, the flow is learn, try, share, reflect, right? So you learn, you watch these videos, and you can try something out. So there are there's always a little activity. One of my favorites is um, we want to give people empathy experiences. So we have people record a bicycle commute all across the globe and you watch them and see what would it be like to commute in Shanghai versus LA by bike. Um, so learn, try, share. The community, just like the group on this call, is amazing. We have people from, who are all busy professionals learning this, practicing this, growing, so we share. And then reflect, just as Ko is doing when interviewing me, thinking about it, thinking about what you've learned, and then trying it again. Yeah. So the videos are, are short and sweet and, um, and not live. Inside of the course, though, we always do a live office hours like this. We also have people from IDEO on the platform and mentors who have taken the course in the past um, who are there to answer questions. And there are many ways to get um, more live feedback as we go. So the community is pretty powerful, and then live out office hours just like this. I'm going to answer two other quick questions around the, the course, and then, and then we'll start to wrap up. Uh, Tom, can I take this with my team? Yes. So the, the course is designed to, it's based on a project. So you will, at the beginning of the course, pick a project. We have a recommended one in the course. You can choose your own as well. And um, it's especially good with a team. So while all, most of the assignments are uh, uh, available to be done individually, we have breakout groups. So for example, right now we have, um, uh, we are running a course right now, Tim Brown's, our CEO is running a course on leading for creativity. And we have a few, we have quite a few teams in there from organizations. So for example, we have a financial team that has people across the globe and there's about 20 of them. And so they have a private breakout group. So as they're doing the work, they, they, they share drafts and do reflections and feedback within. So um, we designed the course for that because we hear that all the time. And whether you, it can, whether you have a big team or just five, like actually four to six people works great. Um, so you can share parts of the process and the assignments together and reflect and learn. Yeah. So yes, I love teams. A, a sweet spot where we see this really work is when you have a team. Yeah. We can make the room private for you so you can discuss things that you do not want the rest of the globe to hear. Or you can go out. And me, even I <laughs> over here. Um, you can have that discussion in the private breakout group, and it's great when you have a globally distributed team. Mm -hmm. We know you want to have that conversation with your other colleagues, and learning is yeah. so. We certainly um, reach out to us. There's some information on our website, but please feel free to re reach out if you need more information about teams. And the last question is um, from Carlo. The one question I see part of the course is about sharing insights. Does that mean you give away your insights, or what does that mean? That's a great question. So what, what we mean by sharing insights is insights in a way to inspire momentum. So you can have a great insight, and maybe you feel it, but if you can't move your team or your organization or other people to want to do something, take action on that insight, it's not a very good insight. So sharing insights is in the course, and it's all about how you craft your insight to create momentum and to inspire others to go on this design journey with you. So yeah. that's what we mean by sharing. And yes. yeah, you, we do want you to share insights. Yes, and we want you, we want you to share them well. That's yeah, important. I mean, absolutely. Yeah. All of the work that we do is very much based. I always say you can have all the insights you want in the world inside of your own head. Figure out how to sway a 
other yep. people, not much is going to happen. And we're all about yep. action and making change and making better experiences yep. out in the world. Yep. So with that, we'll say thank you very much to everyone. We will record this and post it um, as soon as possible, probably within about 24 hours. We'll have this posted if you want to share this with other people. Um, we invite you to come and take our course, Insights for Innovation. You can just go to idou.to slash empathy if you want to sign up. So idou.to. Oh, sorry, IDEO, IDEO.TO slash empathy. Again, apologies that it's backwards. It's backwards. We're going to get really good with our backwards right You can also so. search for IDEOU yeah. in general, and you'll find us. And then, and then you, can look, you can look for me yeah. um, and our fabulous Jane Fulton Surrey. And um, we hope to see some of you there next week. Thanks so much for joining us. Thank you. Bye-bye.